48 to 52, these things were not in the forefront of our mind. Mm -hmm. I don't think we would have thought of them as too far, but we would have just said, well, we'll take care of it later. So, yeah. okay. Well, I, you know, it's uh, quite, uh, quite clear, I believe, that as we went into all of that, we did not have uh, the magnitude of the information processing task uh, calibrated. Uh, scale factors were a little off. Well, you know, they <laughs> were off by a factor of 10 at least. Um, and especially, as you say, this uh, this front end coming in with noisy radar data. And, and uh, so much of it randomly. That, uh, that evolved. I mean, the idea of how big the job was and then what to do about it is something that evolved with the work. Sure. Maybe it's just as well we didn't sit there and worry about oh, it. Oh, if we'd known, we probably wouldn't have uh, been allowed to try. <laughs> <laughs> the well, thing that got to me anyway, and I think to uh, all of us, was was the radar that it comes to like water down a spout. It just has to take it when it's there, and mm -hmm. that really was a problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, no, we understood that problem. I know, we, but I mean, it was... And we really understood the possibility of front-end computers. It's just that one computer was about three times the size of this room. You didn't casually put in another one. <laughs> <laughs> we made a machine that was as fast as we could. Yeah, that's what Bob used to say every time I start to, fast as you can, big as you can. <laughs> that's right, and we'll do what we can with it. They'll come around and say, well, it's really 10% too small. It was a non-constructive remark. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I just haven't understood what I've read, but as I've read various things about World War and I've never quite understood how you buffered that input as it came in from uh, oh, the radar we used, input. We used oh. a drum. We used the drum. Yeah. That's the von Neumann story that you'd probably like to hear. No, there's a drum. Yeah. This was true of Sage also. Yes. And it had two sets of uh, heads on it. Yeah. And when <clears throat> there was a marker channel that told you whether the slot was full or not. And when a message came in from the outside, it would sit in a buffer register, and when an empty slot came up, it would write it in it. And when did the and then when the machine wanted some more radar data, it would go to the drum and it would read off the next bunch that was available. And I take it off of it. It's like having an inbox. Sure. And wh when was the drum introduced? We introduced that in. Let's see. What would it, when would it have been? 52, 52 I think. 52 was our, we went to ERA because they had these beautiful drums on yeah. 1101 and we had one of those. In fact, ones. they had they had a, a, a marker drum of that sort. Now you did a before then, we used the flip-flop registers in the machine. And we only had, if you only have one radar, then the machine, the material, the information came in on a telephone line. And you wrote it in the input register, and then as long as the computer went and got it before another one showed up, you were all right. You know, that, that's exactly what's always puzzled me. How did they? Uh, how we? How did you know the computer would get it before the next input came in? Because we know we knew the minimum length of time before another one would come. I see. You designed the program to go look at least that often. Uh, Radars go around once every fifteen seconds, so we had one. Why oh, is it that slow? Well, no, the 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 machine that took the radar data and converted it into a binary word and sent it on the telephone line. And there was a certain length of time it took for that to be sent over the telephone line and a few other things. So there was a maximum rate at which the radar could send information. Mm -hmm. So what happens is this was adequate because, as Norm says, there's a, the, machine, the radar goes around fairly slowly. So that was reasonably matched. And the length of time, which seemed short to you and me, was a long time to whirlwind. Yeah. And we just made sure we looked, you know. We used to tell ourselves, you know, you go look in the mailbox every day. is a year. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> it really is a year. You got all year. To... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But now when you've got a whole bunch of radars, this becomes uh, too much of a problem. Yes. The way things are done in most computers is by interrupts. And what yeah. it does is the, the mailman comes to the door and rings the bell and you stop what you're doing and you go get the mail. And we didn't do that because the machine would have done nothing but run back and forth to the door and wouldn't have gotten anything done. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, we put an inbox in. Mm -hmm. It so happens that the whirlwind drum was slightly different because um, one of the problems was that su suppose you put a word that you want to store on the drum in the register and then you wait for an empty slot to come by and an empty slot doesn't come by before you fill the, the register up again. Then you had a problem. You lose the word. We started out thinking that was terrible, and then we suddenly realized that radars only see about seventy-five percent of what they're supposed to anyway. So if you throw them away once in a while, well, who cares? Yeah. Worries, yeah. So we just said, well, if another one shows up, you throw the first one away and put the second one in. 
Mm -hmm. Like lose a little noise instead. Uh, Jay, you mentioned that uh, you really hadn't, you had underestimated the input output uh, uh, problem. But, uh, how did, when you first started thinking about whirlwind, and before uh, you'd even done the block diagrams, uh, what did you conceive of the input output as likely to be? What was your expectation? I think at the time the block diagrams were or commissioned, done, work was done, I think we were still probably in the analyzer, the aircraft analyzer phase. That was because the, the sequence, uh, there, there had been a sequence which uh, wasn't mentioned. We went from the analog computer version of the aircraft analyzer to a serial digital computer version of the aircraft analyzer, I believe. And then shifted over right. to a parallel machine, and I think we were still thinking of the, uh, let me see, the analog machine would have been essentially the calendar year of four, 1945. The serial machine would have been the calendar year of 46. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, block diagrams for the parallel machine were in 47. And now I am not absolutely sure. Right. But weren't we still weren't we still rather dominated by the aircraft analyzer thread, said so up through the creation of the block diagrams, but probably shifted very quickly after that. We were still engaged in building the analyzer, but Whirlwind was not intended to do the analyzer job. Whirlwind was a mm -hmm. breadboard, and we expected well, to follow it with a second the, uh, machine of considerably greater capacity because we were well aware that Whirlwind as such would not do the analyzer job. That's right. Mm -hmm. now, it was an experimental product. It was an experimental demonstration unit. Mm -hmm. Now, the Whirlwind had a different input system. The analyzer had a different input system because it had a different problem. There, the machine was supposed to go around and sample the various things that it needed to know when it wanted them. Yeah. So it wasn't a case of, no part of the analyzer was a hundred miles away and had to come over yeah. the phone line. So you had a different problem. The, well, other, the other approach was invented after we began to be, look at the question of how you'd use it for air surveillance. Mm -hmm. On a more general basis though, or on a more general level, the analyzer dealt with sensors and effectors. And Sage did do. Dealt with what? Sensors and effectors. Sure. Yeah, the the essential thing was it was part of a real-time system, and that's sure. what drove its design and general character. Mm -hmm. Even in my master's thesis, uh, I had uh, sensors and effectors, uh, digital servos and analog to digital conversion devices. Uh -huh. I think we did everything as fast as we could. I'm sure the input output register was a parallel feed from the beginning. It wasn't shifting in from the left and right like simple computers do. It was bang, 16 bits. Because the first thing I remember doing was put that optical reader on it, and it was 16 bits. And, and, uh, I don't remember. The tape was uh, 6 bits, I guess. So that, we, I don't know, I think we had 2 or 3 feeds there. But I don't think it was uh, slowed as fast as we, everything was almost as fast as we could put, mm -hmm. so that we didn't have too much of that. And I don't remember the interrupt to get to memory exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, should we go on to the next question? There are some additional uh, parts of question number two, but I think we've pretty well covered the, that one. Which components of the whirlwind were critical and required novel and imaginative software application in order to use the machine? How was that approached? And then there's some sub-questions. Some com components from today's point of view seem to have been very important to world success. Whirlwind success. For example, use of core memory. What were its problems and how did the engineering solutions affect its architecture? Well, we got a bit into that. And uh, we'll get mo into that some more next week. The choice between parallel and serial circuit architecture still made significant difference in operation machines during this period. What differences did you perceive between the workings of Whirlwind and other machines, such as von Neumann's machine at Thompson? And we got into that, but if you have thoughts concerning any of these that you'd like to express, please do. Well, I think your, uh, your question there, as I recall, listed a number of machines, including perhaps the ENIAC. ENIAC was not a general purpose machine, it was plug board programmed, it was mechanically programmed really. Yeah. 
So it didn't belong, it was electronic, but it didn't belong to the class of what we call general purpose machines, which to me at least means that the, in, the, program, the instruction program is in the same internal memory as the computed results and the machine can compute on its own instructions. This is the essential nature of it, and I believe with that criteria, it's a little unclear whether the the Harvard Mark I would be closer to a general purpose machine, but the extent to which it could really do anything except, I don't know whether it actually did choices or switching or not, it might have, but uh, sure. it, well it must have, it would have to, to know when to stop have, the computation. It, it yeah. could do choices, but it had a separate store for that. Wasn't the memory? Uh, it the memory a, was a it straight had, down well, it had memory. A, it had a it punch tape. A, uh, there was storage. no iteration in the address structure. I don't think. It had a punch tape order store, uh, instruction store. Well, in many ways, it, it had was, a number of punch tapes. It was you could, you, which one you went? Which That's one right. you went? But you now the the von Neumann um, Institute for Advanced Study Machine was a general purpose machine in the sense that we're talking about it, as was the Edvac and the Binac, both at Pennsylvania, and the later Univac machines. The, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study Machine under von Neumann was, uh, was in many ways a different machine from the others because it, uh, I never fully understood it. I never really quite was convinced it would work. I think it did. Um, but it was a non-synchronous machine. Whirlwind and most modern machines, as far as I know today, are what I would call clock-timed synchronous machines. Are there non-synchronous uh, machines without a clock these days uh, anywhere of yeah. importance? Uh, use, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the, domino uh, thing. the Institute for Advanced Study Machine proposed that it was important in order to get the highest possible speed that the end of one operation was the thing that triggered the beginning of the next one. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Whirlwind, and I think most modern machines, although I'm out of touch with the details of some of the technology, um, you had a predetermined cycle time, you had a clock running things. If it embarked on a multiplication, you knew in advance how long it was going to take because there were certain steps it went through and the end of the cycle would uh, uh, come and then it would take up some other operation. And so Whirlwind was clock driven, had an oscillator, it had a two megacycle clock in the arithmetic unit and elsewhere a one megacycle, I believe. And uh, that this, uh, this drove it from a central control point. The Institute for Advanced Study Machine was more decentralized and asynchronous. Rather than they did have a leading edge differentiator which gave them a pulse to hit the next one. And uh, we didn't... felt that this was simply unreliable. It was tricky. You couldn't tell. You couldn't be quite sure what would happen. It would be sensitive to wave shapes and various things. I don't think we ever took it seriously or studied it or ever had to make a case for why not to use it. It was just my intuition that uh, you wouldn't, well, want, Neumann, wouldn't want to go down that road. You know, he came to see the five digit multiplier and was excited and gave me all this embrace and all that. Is that right? Bush was with him at the oh time. My. He told me this was the breakthrough. Because we were running at two megacycles and actually had a, a handle on it. And we who, would, who was with him? Bush. Mm -hmm. And we could turn it up to about 2.8 before it quit. Okay. And uh, he thought, they said, this is it. This is the breakthrough. So on some occasion or another, I was invited to Princeton to see the other machine. Because von Neumann used to come to talk to me about engineering feasibility. He did for several different times. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he showed me his machine and he asked me why it didn't work. He was a great believer in things that worked, I must <laughs> say. And uh, so actually he had point-to-point -point wiring. The thing was built in a sort of a cylinder and when he wanted to go from here to here he went right across the cylinder with an open wire. Mm -hmm. Well, just like you know, Cray and people do now. And uh, <laughs> just, so, like, just like Cray and now, different people do now. Well, yeah, <laughs> except that he didn't. This was an unterminated situation. Mm -hmm. Now the worst thing that you can do with an shoot is have a, extra pulses running around. <laughs> so with an unterminated wire, you're, that's the greatest pulse generator around. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't understand why he kept quitting on him. So I suggested a few things. He'd have to slow it down and put in some. 
this is resistors to stop the sharp edges going to they could have one edge and not two or three and I, I thought maybe slowing it down yeah. and changing his rise times might help and seems to me he was a technical assistant Julian Green Julian Bigelow Julian Bigelow he wasn't a technical assistant no he was the chief engineer on the project Gerald Ashton was Bigelow's assistant well anyway there was there was some give and take on this discussion and uh the net result was I never heard anything about it anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but then von Neumann showed up on several other occasions asking my opinion on should he do this or should he do that. Very interesting. One was the Lark and another. Should he buy a Lark? Should he buy a... Uh, and would this machine work that he had for the nuclear energy? And he'd I'd go in a room and it would be all secret. And he'd say, this is a new machine I have to decide on for the, uh, the, some Washington board he was on. And he wanted to know would it work? And you know, it's pretty hard to tell. Look at it. <laughs> 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 but the, the occasion of my first encounter with him was on the Charles study. And this, I think, is kind of interesting because he had an idea that once he was sorting out these airplanes that came in randomly, that we should use one drum to run by the other and get the match on the drum. When they matched, we would put them in a bin, and when they didn't match, we'd hoid them until they found the bin, and then we wouldn't do the sorting in the machine. And Jay uh, was very convincing that a sophisticated machine like ours could do that matching a lot better than that brute force match <laughs> on the drum. Furthermore, I figured out you'd need nine drums to do that. With, I don't know how many radars, but nine drums. And there were 10,000 tubes in each, and I just threw my hands up and said, no way. <laughs> so we went the other way. And lo and behold, a few years later, when we finally built Sage, we had not nine drums, but Bob said 11. And they were just holding the stuff, waiting for the machine to, <laughs> to oh. take it. So he was, he was right all the time. It's just he <laughs> well, there didn't a, have 10,000. I'd like to... No, well, we found a way to get around the 10,000 tubes. I'd like to suggest that uh, one factor uh, here that has never been taken into account, in my experience, in the distinction between IAS and Rowan, yes. is Julian Bigelow himself. And uh, the distinction between... Julian and Jay. <laughs> uh, Julian was an MIT graduate, an engineer, went to work for IBM, came back to MIT. IBM or IAS? Excuse me, MIT. MIT. Before the war. Yeah, I graduated from MIT and went where? IBM. To IBM. To IBM. Uh -huh. uh, Endicott. Came back just before the war when he was threatened by the draft. Uh, joined uh, Norbert, Norbert Wiener on his anti-aircraft fire, fire control project using Wiener's filtering theory as the basis for prediction. That occupied quarters uh, near me in the center of analysis for a long time before they moved over to the other end of the building. And uh, then went into war work and then joined IAS uh, at the end of the war. But he had a highly distinctive style. Uh, he was a, more of a philosopher than a design engineer. He was, Engineering background. You don't, don't think Jay's through. a philosopher? Big pardon? You don't think Jay's a philosopher? Well, not in the sense that Julian was. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when you tell Jay you got to terminate a line, he won't argue with you. Won't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he may be something of a philosopher, but he's, he's a philosopher engineer, engineer, as he very amply demonstrated in his discussion tonight. And... Uh, Julian, had a, when he went about the IAS machine, did it uh, to achieve a particular style. Uh, the wraparound and the straight through wire, he would read part of it. And there were many other features of the design that, uh, that were his features worked out by an artist. He was an artist on that machine. And uh, a wholly different product emerged. And the asynchronous operation was one, but... There are many other things. Well, there's another, there's another way, it'll sound quite different. I think there's another way of describing the artist. I don't know whether this will coincide in any way with what you meant. But one of the things going on then, and I think it still goes on to the detriment of reliable electronics, and that is that people develop an aesthetic sense of the desirability of elegant solutions. Right. And an elegant solution was one that would do four functions with one vacuum tube instead of four functions with eight vacuum tubes. And, uh, and our 
philosophy really was to separate these functions and make each one work right and get each one isolated from the others so it could be controlled and if the four functions took eight tubes it was really a reflection of a passionate overriding belief in Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong it will and you had to fix it so it couldn't. And you go to what I would interpret your comments, and you may want to redefine them so that uh, these aren't the same thing, but you saw people who had a sense of aesthetics and style that revolved around this, uh, what I'll call elegance. They were proud of the fact that they had cut out one tube or they had put in one more function, even if it led to a more marginal and more problematic uh, uh, reliability. And uh, you, you got that sort of difference between what we were doing and others. And uh, from this, uh, also probably uh, developed some of the uh, some of the cost. I mean, there was a much more orderly and explicit relationship between circuits and performance in whirlwind than I think you would have seen in the IAS machines. Oh, absolutely. Oh, we worked on those basic circuits. They, I used to have a th theory. This has to be as reliable as a gear. And everybody said, what? You know, this thing is going to work just like a gear tooth. If you don't think it's going, the next gear is going to come up, then don't do it. And, uh, and uh, there's a very interesting story here. I suppose it's worth repeating. It's far as it's a circuit detail, but it has to do with what Jay just said. We had some tubes made for us, as you may remember. First we went yes. through the commercial tubes, then we had better tubes. And there was a flip-flop tube that was a very high performance in order to get our two megacycle rise times and such. And I was very upset about this because the, in order to get the performance, the grids had to be closer together than my Bell Labs expert had told me, which was three or ten thousandths or something. And I said, uh, is there any way around this? And one of the young circuit engineers went off and he invented a circuit with triodes, which is a much simpler tube to build. Mm -hmm. And we could buy, but we took four triodes to make a flip flop instead of two high performance tubes. Mm -hmm. And we, by letting one, one cathode follower in the middle, we were able to drive the capacity even a faster rate, mm -hmm. even though it took four tubes. But the margins on that were twice as wide. Mm -hmm. And we then switched. Now that took a bit of courage mm -hmm. to go from two tubes to four on every flip-flop, mm -hmm. but the relia but the mar margins indicated that we should do it. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the tube was much easier to make, mm -hmm. and they had less than emittance, and, it, and they're still running. <laughs> Even now, they tell me they're still running. So, you know, we, but that was the kind of philosophy we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, in the middle of all this. I had a tremendous respect for, for, I was frightened to death if we had too many failures, we'd get one climbing up the back of the other. Yes. So I was uh, bending over backwards myself, and, uh, and everybody got, got, seemed to follow along with that, and as far as the circuit engineers were concerned. Mm. And Jay was backing me up whenever we had a discussion of this. He never said, we can't stand it. Mm. He, just, he just looked... Is it was there were, there were, uh, we answered that question to your satisfaction? Yeah, you mean a machine and <laughs> a thing, you say still running. I, I will uh, add this postscript is more than that. our remarks. Yeah, yeah. 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 Both uh, the know, elements of whirlwind the the and of the IES machine are in the Smithsonian here. exhibit. Yes. Are they uh, not? Both there? Still there? The, uh, there was from time to time introduced into the whole whirlwind program by various people some nice insights into uh, how people function and organizations. And I believe this is a true story, though I don't know whether there would be any documentation. We had developed, as Norman mentioned before, uh, you know, essentially one design step going from tubes that had a nominal life of 500 hours, they actually lasted longer than that, up to tubes that perhaps would last 500,000 hours by taking the silicon out of the nickel and uh, going through the more expensive processing. The, the silicon had been put in there intentionally for a reason to make them easier to process. Give you more electrons. For and uh, that work had been done in cooperation with an engineer at Sylvania. And then it came time to produce these. Now, what I was leading up to is this comment, if there's any verification for it. Uh, that man, and I've forgotten his name now, took the position 
that those tubes we wanted could not be made in any city where vacuum tubes had ever been made before. That if you wanted to make tubes like that, you had to make a plant out in some town where nobody knew anything about vacuum tubes, so you wouldn't have the bad practices yeah. of breaking off into this. Uh, yeah. tubes. That's a good story. I'm glad yeah. you told it. I think it was in his. It was in a remote town in Pennsylvania where he got this laboratory, but it wasn't a production, and he was going to build a production line right there with people that he would hire right from that little town, which he did, and uh, and it worked. Yes. I mean, you had to tell people to wear kerchiefs on their heads to get through the lint. You had to do all these things, which people would say, oh, no, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. You see, the history of vacuum tubes up to that time was that you had a very large number of vacuum tube types on the market. And a lot of them didn't sell in large numbers. But a vacuum tube making machine turned them out at a tremendous rate. And so you could buy General Electric vacuum tubes or RCA vacuum tubes or Sylvania vacuum tubes but none of those companies had enough demand to run a machine, each of them to run a machine for every type of tube. So for one thing, one of them would make a batch of a certain type and then re uh, transfer it. Everybody would sell from that production lot. And even, even that didn't, you see, allow a machine to run continuously for most of these types. So you'd have to uh, run a machine for a while, days or weeks, and shut it down, put some other kind of tube on, and maybe a year or two later, you would fire it up again to make that other type. And I, I have been told that when these companies would come back and try to re-establish a particular tube type, in some of the worst cases, they would run a machine for two or three months before they had kind of gotten back the <laughs> skill and the subtleties of how to turn that, that particular tube out so that it would, uh, would meet the specification. You would probably make five years' worth of effective tubes while you tried to get a year's worth of good ones. <laughs> well, if you remember, when you used to change tubes in your radio set, oh. some of them didn't work. <laughs> they had, they had the wrong so that's the, that's the atmosphere, you see, that we were moving into when we wanted to make tubes where you could put uh, tens of thousands of them in, uh, in one uh, air defense control center and expect to get reliability. Okay, I had one question here that was really a matter of detail, but following up on what you, your very good comparison of uh, Whirlwind with other machines. Uh, I have a quote here that you've look, looked at, I'm sure, from July 29, 1948, in which you compare Whirlwind with, an, this is in quotes, machines existing today, close quotes. And um, that immediately caught my eye because I thought machines existing today, there were a number under construction. What did you have in mind uh, when you were making that comparison, or, or is that just a, a matter of the way? Well, well, whether existing meant finished, or whether existing meant under development, I'm not sure unless you had more of the context, but there were existing machines. The Harvard Mark I mechanical existed, yeah. of course. It was running well before that time. Yes. The Harvard Mark II was running by that time. Yes. The, uh, in 47, the I SSEC think. The SSEC was running. The, the SSEC, a very curious... Uh, Kluge of lots of things. Uh, at IBM in New York City was running sometime in that period. Yeah, yeah. Was Do you know what date Maniac that was? had been uh, running. Yeah, that right. was July 29th, 1948. That, if a year later, I, I would, there were a number of others, but... There were 10 machines running in 1950. That was the occasion of the first National Computer Conference. Yeah. I was program chairman. And I was able to find 10 machines in the world that were running. Uh -huh. Now, yeah. the 1101 might have That's been... That's documented. Yes. And, uh, and that was in 50. The ERA 1101 might have been running then. You may have the date over there on the Well, board. I think so, because yeah. uh, Frank Mullaney gave a speech. And one of the great three was it must be documented and running to give the speech. Mm -hmm. I think, remember no. we tried to do <laughs> it? Well, there were uh, interesting little sidelights. Von Neumann pointed out once when all of these machines were under development, that every machine, every project had its characteristic completion time. There were projects that were always six months from completion, yes. projects that were always a year from completion, <laughs> projects that were always two years from completion. <laughs> oh, you forgot 18 months. Uh, 18 months was the magic figure. <laughs> you knew you wouldn't finish it less than that. You knew you mm -hmm. wouldn't get the money if you said any more than that. I believe that we had one of the longest characteristic completion times, but it had the same character. It, uh, <laughs> it was, I remember a fellow with the Rockefeller Differential Analyzer. I can't remember his name now. 
who told me that he had been afraid to go home. This had been a year previously. He'd been afraid to go home for Christmas because he thought they might get the machine running while he was away, and they hadn't got it running yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a real stretch out. There was no originally, it was the 1939 difference, not a lot of it. But uh, 1939 came and went to 1943 before there was a glimmer of successful adoration. How were alternative input output devices evaluated? What was the process of choice here? That's a tough Would the originator of that question. <laughs> How many were there to choose between? <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by alternative. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you know, there was a lot of fishing around because the field had not settled down. We, uh, we used tapes that Raytheon made. We used magnetic drums that ERA made. We put a lot of time and tape. effort into a photographic input-output system that Eastman Kodak made that never or succeeded. Or tried to make. Tried to make, never succeeded. Was it technically inadequate? Oh. Well, it was too dense. We, we slowed it down by a factor of four by Easy. making the spots bigger, and then we finally got it to work. And uh, then we found, like our storage tubes, that the electronic beam that was reading these spots, electronic beams don't go where you tell them to. This charge is inside the envelope mm -hmm. to affect this, and that was what the storage tube problem was. They also had that problem when they were using their beam as a light source. Mm -hmm. They didn't know it any more than we did, so it wandered around depending on how many electrons you were spraying in there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so when we found that out, we knew that that was their problem, too. We didn't need to look again. <laughs> it was fundamentally not a good idea. I guess you're right. And I think, uh, you know, it wasn't then known what you could do with tapes. Basically, tapes, you know, uh, took over the uh, process and have been followed and still in use and uh, uh, were fundamentally better, but the... Uh, for some reason, the, the technology of using them just wasn't uh, fully appreciated or uh, or developed. I don't know why one would. We had have done uh, it. we used 100% redundancy on the tapes in mm. order to make them work. Mm. The error rates, the flaws on the tapes were severe. Yes, uh, the heads were got dirty, and we didn't. Not, all uh, all those techniques were not developed. Mm. I made a very very strenuous attempt in IBM to bring about the use of. Uh, Photographic storage is the primary storage for business systems. The storage medium could not be altered without detection, or in the case of conventional film, it uh, could be regarded as, as almost archival storage in the sense of microfiche and microfilm. Yes. Well, of course, you can really? say that that effort to use optical storage was. Uh, was just a matter of 40 years ahead of its time. I was looking at a technical program in uh, computers here the other day, the whole thing devoted to uh, optical storage and uh, laser recording on various kinds of optical media, including erasable ones. Not <laughs> <laughs> well, well, super this time or not. <laughs> well, well, the RCA uh, uh, disks technology really works. The, the, the disks really are good. I don't know whether they're good enough for digital stars or not, but uh, I think they think they are. Uh, of course, International Telemeter and then iTech worked on the disks that uh, Gil King brought into IBM. <laughs> that was broken. <laughs> <laughs> Did break them. I don't know whether you said input or whether you just said terminal equipment there, yeah, but uh, Whirlwind was, uh, was uh, I, I presume, I believe the first machine to use cathode ray output, cathode ray uh, displays. In fact, we never built a machine without one of those. See, I had one very early, but uh, no earlier than you, certainly. Ed, how would you answer this one? How did problems and solutions contribute to the architecture of later machines? We just told you. <laughs> uh, uh, how did problems? <laughs> how did problems and solutions contribute to the architecture of later machines? I mean, our problems and solutions are their problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's the user's problem. Well, I think if you uh, if you look at what was done in Whirlwind, I I believe you can probably support the statement pretty clearly that more came out of Whirlwind into later day machines than from any other machine at that time. I am speaking of things like the synchronous logic that we mentioned, um, the cathode ray display, um, the, real -time the uh, magnetic core storage. There's a list a dozen or 15 long. I'm not uh, 
Well, just look at it's more TX2. Than Are we familiar with TX2? It no. was completely genetic, and that, for a long time, was the fastest machine in the country was it? for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the Roman is kind of the predecessor of the mini computers, yes. controls mm -hmm. machines, which are characterized by the same uh, um, sim simple, straightforward logic, and fairly short register lengths, high speed, high reliability, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the big number crunchers. Mm -hmm. I have a copy of the list of first uh, <clears throat> that uh, was at the Smithsonian. Uh, nobody knew who would exhibit at the Smithsonian. It's a very impressive list. Yeah, we those papers were circulated. As to mm -hmm. what first, as TX2 has a fairly good sized cache memory on it, mm -hmm. and that was running. Is that right? Yeah. When did it go into operation? Just before I left 56, something like that. Very good. 58 from It was, I think it was around 56. TX2. <laughs> Ford, describe the interaction because of the it was running before, uh, was running, uh, well, before uh, MITRE was formed. Uh, uh, describe the interaction in the working environment. Where and when did you talk about plans, problems, and solutions? Over lunch on the machine room floor and regular meetings? Well, Jay, let me invite you to start out with your teas. And responding to that, and your Friday afternoon cleanup. <laughs> well, there were several formal things. Uh, I did have a Friday afternoon discussion and a tea in my office with group leaders, where we would discuss problems and what to do about them. We also had a Biweekly report, which everyone wrote a contribution to, might be only a paragraph, as to what he was doing, what his problems were. And this was uh, collected and printed uh, very quickly, so I believe it was written on Friday and it probably became available to all people by perhaps Tuesday, uh, so that everyone had a statement from everyone as to what they were doing, what they'd accomplished, and problems. And I think from my viewpoint, the uh, a most important thing that I believe we came close to achieving in nearly full, uh, full scale, was an organization in which bad news would flow uphill. And that's in sharp contrast to some organizations where, Most pe <laughs> where people try to put their best impressions forward and hide their mistakes and their problems until it's too late. And this was true all the way up to that stage, at least. And uh, In other words, it was the whole environment of that structure inside the computer lab and outside. And uh, you really expected that the higher level administrative people were there to help if you needed help, and uh, the culture was that you had, you should get help as soon as it's needed. And so the idea was that the people upstream were not there to pat you on the back, they were there to help solve problems when you had them. I think that may be I think it's very important, and I think it's probably a reasonably fair statement in comparing the organization with uh, with a lot of other organizations. So these two might know better than I whether it really worked. <laughs> no, I think that's true, and the reason we is afraid the you talk about problems. In fact, that was the only interesting thing to talk about mm -hmm. after you have an environment where that is charged. There was a lot of so much more informal, open door discussion than any other situation like. That. There were four of us had a carpool for one thing. Mm -hmm. Bob and I and Gus O'Brien and Steve Dodd, and we drove back and forth to Cambridge for years. And uh, Bob would sometimes, you know, the, the flow of conversation, Bob would immediately say, if something was discussed that wasn't in the car, we better have a meeting with so-and-so this morning. And, you know, within a half an hour, we'd have everybody in the room. And, and it wasn't, it was no uh, formality of that sort. Mm -hmm. There was no concern that Jay was or was not there or something. He didn't worry about it one way or the other. And he didn't know about it soon if it was important or not if it wasn't. And we'd resolve it or not. And I mean, it was, it was a very free, there was, no, there was no, hierarchy, no hierarchy in that thing that I could detect. 
Nobody felt that they, I worked for so-and-so, so I can't talk to so-and-so. All the companies I work for strangle themselves with mm. the hierarchy. And uh, we didn't have any hierarchy. Now you see Nat Sage being essentially non-technical, but he would visit with people who worked for me to get his own impressions as to whether he thought people knew what they were doing. And uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, strata, this level skipping, <coughs> Very important because it saves people's time and uh, draws in the people that need to be drawn in. And you can do it if there is uh, enough sense of individual security so that people aren't threatened by it and if people higher up don't use their information for recrimination and censure. If they use it for helping, then this, this works. But in a lot of organizations, you find that that kind of information soon gets used for, to the detriment of the source of the information. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happens, then the whole process uh, stops. The source dries up pretty fast. Yeah, I think the example of that is the Department of Defense. <laughs> people, at the top, people at the top of the Department of Defense are all the time complaining because somebody comes in and says, I'm sorry to tell you that Project X is a year late and $200 million over budget. And they said, but we had a DSARC last week and you said everything was fine. So they're always saying, how can we get information earlier? <clears throat> they tend to want to put in reporting schemes. Mm -hmm. But that's not their problem. The problem is if you go up the chain in the Department of Defense and tell them you're having trouble, you're lost. Because they'll descend on you, you'll spend all your time making briefings, investigation groups show, show up. <clears throat> Uh, you've lost. You haven't got a chance once you've admitted that you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So nobody will admit it until it's gotten so bad that it can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. Then he will admit it because he's lost it. He's lost anyway. Yeah. And so I've, I've been telling those guys for years. I said, if you will help the guy when he tells you, he will tell you. Otherwise, he won't. And there's nothing you can do about it in the way of directives that mm -hmm. will fix it. Great. Harry, uh, maybe we ought to get the drinks now and uh, get food in a little while and then sit down and talk about a couple of the other questions which we can uh, talk about All right, great. Uh, because uh, we, we do have another session coming up right. and uh, we don't don't need to cover everything tonight. Um, I'd like Guys, to are, are there changing uh, cast for the next one? Who's, yeah, who's, who's going to be in the next one? Let's see, Gordon Brown joins us next time, right? Right, right. That, that's the only change. I mean, it'll be this group plus Gordon. Yes, I think that's not. the change. Yes. And you're on the list, but you're not. I'd like to get on to the uh, Turing question and the... Uh, oh, right, great. And the... Uh, I just can't make it uh, another week right now. Salmon question. All right. That would be a good one to talk about over over some food. No, I agree. Well, here are the drinks. Um, Maybe you should turn on some lights if it's easy to do. Yeah, we don't need call that. That would be great. Are these the lights? No, oh, no, no. There's a master switch back here. Right back there. Uh, what shape is called, Jen? I don't know. I didn't know he needed a shape. Uh, well, yeah, those are your lights. Did everything? Very good. Uh, one more. He, he's in retreat from people. and Reclusive. Oh, Reclusive. That's the one I'm looking for. And he always has been for a long time, but I think he's pretty good at the Physically, yeah, he's well, it's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to hear. Well, it's good to hear. Well, it goes back a long time. He was a graduate student. He was a distinctly good memory. He wasn't supposed to do anything. No, no, no. He was. 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 He and there certainly is some relationship, and I'd like to explore that relationship. I don't think it's the usual, uh, it's the causal relationship that's usually assumed. But there were a couple of other people who, uh, whose ideas were certainly, are certainly important in uh, the development of uh, modern computer science. But uh, how far, uh, for example, did, were you aware of or conscious of Turing and his work? Uh, had you read the uh, 1936 article, and was that uh, in any way uh, a factor in, in any of your thinking? Not unless it entered through the channels that we had spoken of before, the uh, von Neumann University of Pennsylvania, the general atmosphere. I don't think I ever have read the Turing paper, as far as I know. We discussed it once, Jack, and I think you discussed it. I remember having the 
hearing you discuss it, and I, I don't remember very much more about it than that. I can't even. Uh, it's a. Uh, but somewhere in the during the work on the machine. Well, I think it's uh, my my impression at this stage, still not remembering that I've ever read it, but hearing yeah. a lot about it is yeah. that it's a. Uh, it's Can't kind we? of a theoretical concept, but very little to do with uh, the way you would design a machine. That's my impression. Mm -hmm. I think that I've read the paper, but it certainly had no direct effect on us. Well, you it had any indirect effect, I can't say. Yeah. You think you think that the name though was known to you? Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we well, when did it first became? He was well known. Mm -hmm. He came to see us once. Oh, well, he was you. Was that when he was oh. at Harvard for the Aiken meeting? I don't know, I remember it. Early forty-seven. He had long hair in a time when long hair was uncommon. Yes. <laughs> We had so many visitors, it's pretty hard to oh, separate them. Right. <laughs> You're right. But uh, I, I did not, uh, I was not influenced by his paper. I didn't uh, skim it. I, I can't say I even read it until probably into the 50s or even later. Mm -hmm. But I was at the Harvard meeting that he attended, and he did express himself there, and I do remember it very well. Mm -hmm. What about... Uh, I've heard the Turing machine, and I can't recall what, what it was. Well, he wrote the paper on, uh, that carried the title on the theory of computability, 1935, I think it was, and uh, in it, to deal with the issue of computability, he described a, a computer, well, he described a, a mechanism, uh, a very primitive, generic sort of mechanism, performing just the bare minimum of instructions, Performing a bare minimum of functions, but could, which could be counted as a primitive computer. Was it ever a physical machine? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But Turing. No, I think it was a, a thought an idea. Did you know that we did idea. that with TX0? It was the most primitive machine we could figure out. <laughs> and Olson and I used to argue whether we had an eight or uh, ten or well, four. TX0 is the <laughs> pinnacle of sophistication compared to the Turing well, machine. Well, we had That's micro, right. off, <laughs> micro code in here. No, no, he invented this thing as the. As the least thing that could carry out any computation he wanted. The fact yeah. that it was enormously inefficient was of no importance to him because he wasn't trying to build a machine. TX0 was sophisticated. <laughs> 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 well, he must have gotten down to add and store. That's all. The That's Turing machine look, made simple Simon look sophisticated. That's right. But uh, Turing's work in uh, cryptanalysis in England during the war must have been a factor in uh, enhancing his reputation and standing in the period after the war. Yep. And it was probably only after the war that the paper he wrote in thirty-five became in any way widely known. Mm -hmm. well, there's no question that he was a brilliant man. But the question of whether the things we were working on were computable or not never, never entered our mind. <laughs> <laughs> anybody come around and say, what are you working on that for? You can't compute it even if you get the machine? And, uh, <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to interpolate this remark apropos of what I had to say about Julian Bigelow earlier and his being a philosophical engineer. His, one of his passions was computability in the Turing sense. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> All I can tell you is it never bothered us. <laughs> what What about Shannon's work? In the same the same sense. I mean, what What did you know of of it, and how important was it in any of your work? And uh... essentially the same answers. We knew Shannon was there. We knew him by sight. Uh, Read his papers. Uh, interesting, but uh, I don't believe there's any any identifiable carryover or necessity or even applicability. I would say the Turing concept might be in some way be conceptually more related uh, than Shannon's work is. Some of the, you might equally say, did quantum theory have any effect on this? Yeah. Well, some of the young, bright people used to bring up the Shannon theory, which, which has to do with information and bandwidth. Yes. And they used to take some of our ideas and try to say we could reduce them or better than we did. You know? And uh, we used to listen. <laughs> but I remember that we knew pretty well what we wanted to do and why we wanted to do it. We didn't need too much. By the time we were had the, the machine was laid out, it was uh, yes. Uh, there was a lot of question of could we do this, that, or the other thing. And Franklin, Professor Franklin, uh, spent a lot of time uh, looking into uh, the computability of certain functions and whether it could be worked on the whirlwind. And usually found a way. Mm -hmm. One way or another. 
That's a different kind of computability. I know, but I, that I remember better than I do these other things. There were other things, things that concerned me more than either of those streams, and yeah. that was uh, the ideas of thermal noise. I'm not sure that they should have concerned me. They've never been much of an issue. But I think I was very, very concerned, very disturbed, as we started to talk about pulse circuits and uh, very short pulses as to whether or not there could be enough random thermal noise rising to a high enough level to begin to interfere with what we wanted. This may have been only a reflection of my not uh, really interpreting the whole thing correctly. I can't quite now imagine why uh, it ought to have been an issue for what we were doing. But I know that, uh, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to do things like the five-digit uh, multiplier was to find out where mistakes could come from. Where they did come from, I think, were elevators in three buildings away and streetcars and things like that. Let's <laughs> <laughs> keep in mind, Jay, I had just spent eight years on signal to noise ratios and radars that almost didn't work. And I had a first rule that if you didn't have 10 dB signal to noise ratio, forget it. <laughs> so everything was really, there was no noise on the scopes anywhere. And, I, we, we, and we had all kinds of coupling relationships. There was no way you could get into that problem yeah, or a win or any of that other I would say we were more concerned about the theories of factors of safety. <laughs> yeah, we probably overkilled it on the other end. They, th they say we did. The modern machines are nowhere near that way. Well, we didn't try to shave anything, really. Well, yes, I would say that we, you know, we built machines more reliable than are being built today. That's right. The Sage Air Defense uh, Centers worked a great deal better than today's time-sharing machines, which are apt to be out of service. Uh, anywhere from uh, once a day to uh, several times. Well, well, the only yeah. machines around that are sort of like Sage are the tandem machines. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know whether their signal noise ratios are as much. They don't use that kind of design very much in these days, do they? Well, I don't know anything about the details. It's just I understand the design philosophy. Is this, you know, yeah. It's supposed to run all the time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The uh, shadow moves large in my mind is a uh, Pre-World World, World, World War II uh, participant in affairs here in the late 30s and early 40s, before he went to Bell Labs, yep. that he had uh, Wiener and Bush as his principal mentors, and um, was devoted to them and they to him. And uh, they made contributions to him that resulted in his getting the AIEE prize for the best paper of its kind, published probably in 1939 which was the paper on symbolic logic applied to relay circuits. Yes. And the paper did present the, the application of symbolic logic to the design of relay circuits for computing, yep. which was extremely interesting to me. So it, I, I was greatly influenced by Shannon's early work, and I look forward with keen anticipation to the appearance of the mathematical theory of communication after the war, but it was a disappointment to me. Yeah. But let's stick to that uh, article on relay circuits. Um, as, as somebody who's not an electrical engineer, uh, I have the, had the impression that there was a really major change in the profession in the understanding of how to design circuits somewhere there in the 30s. I wouldn't make that claim. No. Relay circuits. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. The, the, oh, I see. the application of Boolean logic and so on to relay circuits. Yeah. People did apply such things to vacuum tube circuits, but we didn't. We uh, aimed for simplicity for the reasons that Jay talked about earlier. Well, we had a, see, Boolean doesn't take into account the time equation. Yeah. I can remember one of the students. We had a, Bob and I and this student were having a design argument. <laughs> and I, could, I just happened to remember this one the other day. And uh, he had proved that we need uh, 16 gate tubes to form, perform yeah. some function. Special add or whatever it was, which is the double length thing. And... Uh, Bob and I were discussing this, I remember, on the way home. But we had a clock, and we could make one of these pulses show up any time we wanted to with a little delay line. So the next morning we went in and we had it done with three. Mm -hmm. And the bullion, he said, I can't compete with you guys. You, 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 you use time, and that isn't the book. It wasn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't fair. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. Now, nowadays, when gates are so cheap, people really do pile up levels of logic and so on, which didn't make any sense to us at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Seymour Cray, in order to get his multiplier, he had a 64-bit multiplier working in one microsecond. Yep. He had 
the, the Wiffle Tree of Logic, to go through that thing, had over 5,000 transistors in it. Now, we didn't use 5, we wouldn't use 5,000 transistors for the whole issue, ever. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he just threw them in there because he, his logic was all built up. It was a, uh, for each combination. Yeah, it would have been very expensive. We know how to build things like that, too. But they'd be very expensive. And they also present a difficult to uh, um, check out and maintenance oh, problems. The, the diagnostics in that is tough. And we really spent a bit of time trying to make s s automatic diagnostics. I think for the time period we were in, we probably did more than most people do. That matter, if I remember rightly, and I'm not sure I do, Sage has um, speeds up its carries with a, a certain amount of that stuff for the high speed motor. Maybe we did that, don't we? Quite even like that. But it turns out that the percentage of operations which are multiplies is so small uh -huh. that even if you run them down, ran them down to zero, you wouldn't save more than like 10 percent or anything. Uh -huh. So it got kind of pointless. The, the place where you really gained was shortening the cycle time of the memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why the caching memories became such a big thing mm -hmm. after that. Yes. And the, in, um, in one place, uh, you talk about, uh, uh, the, the, in this the book, talks about uh, uh, reading an ad revived your, or reminded you of things you thought about with regard to, uh, uh, to memory. Delta Max. That's right. Uh, but it leaves it leaves the reader puzzled as to uh, what, what, when were you thinking about that earlier and what was that that you were thinking about? And well, it was in, uh, I think, 1947, two years before the uh, <clears throat> actual work began on the magnetic memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, you know, made the observation that we had flip-flops which were information storage in uh, separate individual points or locations. There were the delay lines, the magnetic acoustic delay lines, which were essentially storage down a uh, line. Uh, there were the storage tubes, the electrostatic storage tubes, which are storage on a surface. And why not store in three dimensions in a solid array? Because this would be the highest density. And I had fully worked out in concept, and uh, that was reported in notebooks at the time, a three-dimensional array of storage elements that were both stored and switched by operating through glow discharge tubes like a neon light bulb. And if those neon light bulbs worked the way the published curves show, and if they were high speed, and if they were not secondary emission devices whose characteristics would change, and if they were not sensi you know, temperature sensitive, and a few more ifs, and particularly if they were higher speed than they actually were, uh, there was a, there, uh, there, one could have made a memory. The, the, uh, the theoretical concept, the, uh, the logical concept, was fully worked out around neon glow tubes as the storage element and the switching element to get access to the dimensions of the storage array. And one uh, master's thesis was done exploring the characteristics of glow discharge tubes. And I went and talked to Edgerton and Germanshausen probably, the people who were doing glow discharge work and flash tubes, about the possibility of uh, taking a metal plate, punching holes in it, stacking them up with e interleaved dielectrics running wires through these holes in such a way that you could mass produce individual glow cells, putting the whole thing then in a vacuum so you didn't have a separate vacuum around each one. Uh, no attempt was ever made to really do more than just test the individual neon tubes because it just never passed my sense of uh, how you had to deal with Murphy's Laws. I mean, I, uh, it, uh, it wasn't was there a problem with that. a field day without one. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, wasn't the n-dimensional network approach. You couldn't make one wire run through many of these switches to get that readout system, which is really what made it simple. Um, 
No, there was a there was a at least a uh, conceptual uh, way of getting the readout it, from a three dimensional array and access through the coordinate axis. Because the fellow who worked on that, with his thesis student, got in touch with me yeah. and said that it was his invention and and would I uh, help him uh, counter your invention? <laughs> and uh, I tried to get him. To, I was he was at Reliance Electric at the time and. And I visited that plant, and he dug me out and gave me, oh, I had a real, I didn't express to me, expect this, you know. And so uh, I finally told him that uh, from what I knew about that, which was little, I, there was no way to get the, the, the single readout from the multiple cores. It was a, the circuit that he talked about was not n dimensional. I mean, you couldn't have as many wires through the wall as you wanted. He only he could have three. And uh, he did never succeed in convincing me that that wasn't a problem. I, I didn't know that you thought there was. Right? Well, I can't tell you now how that was solved. And, uh, and in any case, I wouldn't propose for a moment that it was practical because there were problems before you ever got to that <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, just well, the whole, uh, I mean, just the elements weren't... Uh, well, of course, the sort of we all know about that. But I, I uh, believe, as far as I know, the logic was in principle workable uh, for a three-dimensional array. Although I must say that I don't know at the moment how exactly you're going to test the, uh, the unique element. Uh, in any case, uh, to answer Ithiel's uh, question, that had existed two years before, and I saw no... I did not have any belief that the practicality was such that we should invest more than just a master's thesis looking at the elements and after that it was laid aside. Uh, but the idea was sitting there with the awareness that if a suitable nonlinear element could be found and uh, that you could put into that sort of concept, you could get a uh, three-dimensional addressable array. And so I don't remember actively looking for an element, but in retrospect I was clearly sensitized to it because the evening that I was leafing through the Electrical Engineering magazine and saw the rectangular hysteresis loop of Delamax, I just stopped on that page and I said, what could you do with this in that prior concept? And I proceeded right then and there to go out and walk the streets at night in the spring evening thinking about it for two or three days until it had been put together well enough to go into my notebooks, which uh, people have uh, perused and still exist, I guess, up here in the archives, and uh, basically laid out the whole logic that was pursued right up to the time when Solid State took over. And uh, at that time, however, you see, the questions about uh, whether it would work were far from answered. I mean, these hysteresis loops were obtained by an AC current going from one extreme to the other and tracing a hysteresis loop. That did not necessarily say that if you went partway around the loop and backed off, uh, that it would uh, respond the way the loop said. There was no reason to be confident that if you would keep hitting it with a half impulse, it wouldn't sort of uh, gradually